Well, thank you, Biff. That was awesome. I was trying to figure out what you're better at, whistling or having a Jamaican accent, because I've never heard you whistle before. So uh, that was great. And uh, those songs will both be included in the Bob and Biff hymnal that uh, will be never coming out soon. So, hey, uh, thanks for tuning in tonight and uh, being a part of uh, Revelation Explained. As uh, Biff said, we're in our 24th session. Uh, we're actually going to be in chapters 17 and 18 primarily. So as Biff said, we're getting uh, close to the end of the book and we're really uh, getting into some amazing material. Difficult, I got to say, what we're looking at tonight in terms of the symbolism, interpreting it, uh, again, it's going to be a time when uh, I'm going to have to say to you there's a lot of different ideas about what this means. Now, <clears throat> if you were with us last week, you know that we looked at the way that Revelation portrays the second coming of Christ. Uh, and you know, I think that uh, for those of us that are uh, believers, uh, we talk a lot about how uh, we really are looking forward to the second coming of Christ. But I was thinking this week, um, have you ever pondered why? Uh, why are we looking forward to the second coming of Christ? Or maybe even the question, then what? W what happens when Christ comes? And um, in the, uh, the passage we looked at on Armageddon, uh, Antichrist and the false prophet were both destroyed. Uh, the armies of the world had been defeated. But what happens next? And uh, tonight, I'm actually going to go back uh, to two chapters that preceded uh, the return of Jesus, because the chronology of these chapters is really kind of difficult, and, and really what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, the fall of Babylon, so ties into both the Battle of Armageddon and the return of Christ that it's, uh, it's really hard to div divide this event from those events. But it's one of the major themes of the book, and actually it's a big reason why both the tribulation and the second coming takes place. And so tonight, two big areas of teaching I'm going to be looking at one is uh, who or what is Babylon, and uh, the other is the actual fall or destruction of Babylon. wanted to remind you, and I've gotten a couple of emails this week of people that wanted to get on the mailing list, uh, the email list, because I send out an email every week kind of telling you, uh, reminding you about Wednesday night, what's coming, and just give you a little bit of a teaser. So uh, if you aren't receiving those uh, emails and you'd like to, just send me an email at this address and I'll make sure that you uh, uh, get on that list. Let me begin by doing a little bit of an intro uh, to coming events. And that is if we go back uh, to chapter 16, which is the, the outpouring uh, of the the bowls of wrath, uh, we read this. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple, from the throne, saying, It is done. And the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Uh, the bowls, as we saw, were the kind of the final outpouring or the final execution of the redemptive uh, and just judgments of God to reclaim that which is his uh, and to redeem uh, in in the final form, the planet and those that believe to him. And in that final outpouring uh, of God's wrath, there is a special recipient uh, in the book of Revelation. Again, symbolically, uh, we'll see what that uh, represents. But chapter 17 and 18 amplify on these texts. And the big message is this that uh, when things come to this point and when Armageddon is over and Christ has returned, 
that Babylon has fallen. The ultimate uh, and final and total destruction uh, by God of that which Revelation calls Babylon the Great. So uh, first of all, Babylon, let me take a little bit and introduce you to the whole concept of Babylon and how it, from its origins, got to where it gets here in the book of Revelation. The origin uh, of the city and the answer to the question, what is Babylon, um, it goes, uh, begins in chapter 17, uh, and, and I'm going to go all the way back to the book of Genesis in a second, but in chapter 17, where we read this, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Now remember, this comes in the book after what we've just read in chapter 16. Okay? And then he tells us this, And he carried me away in the Spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Now, by the way, I use the New International Version Bible. And I don't always think that it translates the original text uh, quite as strongly as some other versions because most uh, other versions here would refer to her as the mother of whores. And, uh, and so it, it can mean a prostitute, but it generally the word that's used means a harlot or, or a whore. And I think there's a little more punch uh, to that word in terms of what's being talked about here in, in the text. Now, uh, short history of Babylon, again, it, it really goes back uh, to Babylon as a geographic location, goes back to Genesis chapter 11, and in Genesis chapter 11 we have the story of the Tower of Babel. And uh, Babel uh, really is, is a, a way... There's, there's a, it's synonymous with the word Babylon. Um, now, the whole world had one language and a common speech, we're told. And as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now, Shinar, uh, that area geographically becomes Babylonia. So it becomes the region of Babylonia. Uh, but at this point in time, it's referred to as Shinar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Well, first of all, remember that, that God's intentions was that humanity would spread uh, over the whole earth, but now we have this situation where uh, a group is coming together and they're going to build a city and in that city they're going to build a tower uh, that they say reaches to the heavens and the objective being somehow and the, the thinking of the cosmology of the day was literally that the higher physically you got the closer you were, not simply to the physical heavens, but, but to the whole idea of the heavenlies and, and what was contained there. Uh, they were called ziggurats, uh, is uh, the kind of technical term, because uh, a number of these were then built throughout uh, ancient history. And again, the, uh, one of the primary reasons was that they were used for astronomy, uh, to study the skies, and in those days uh, there was a, a, such a strong connection between astronomy and astrology that astronomers were astrologists and they believed they could read the heavens and uh, by doing so that they could tell what was going to happen on earth. So you look at this passage and, and you see a number of things. One, they want to centralize instead of spread. 
they build a zag- ziggurat uh, for astrological purposes. Um, and I can't remember it. In some either text or study that I did, originally the name of the city was to be Bab Eli, which meant the gate uh, of God or the gateway to heaven. So again, part of the intention of what they were doing in building this. And, uh, the, and, and it's, it's as if they are going to get to God on their own terms. Hey, let's build a tower, make a name for ourselves, and we, this will become the gateway uh, to God. And in response to that, of course, we know that God uh, comes down, sees what's going on, and uh, confuses their language. We read this, and this is God speaking, Come, uh, to I, I believe the angelic host, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, and again, or it's a connected to the word Babylon, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And the, and the word Babel literally means confusion. And so what comes out of this human attempt to uh, perhaps to reach God and, and uh, you know, to make a name for themselves, this egotistical uh, enterprise, is that confusion comes. And this is the way that the Bible portrays the origin of languages around the world. They're scattered and their languages are scattered. Now, what we're not told in chapter 11, but if you go back to chapter 10, uh, I believe you get the uh, insight into this that the person behind this idea was a man uh, by the name of Nimrod. And uh, Nimrod was the grandson of Ham, uh, one of the descendants of Noah. And Ham and his descendants uh, tended to uh, migrate to, uh, to uh, southern, excuse me, northern Africa and even across into the region uh, of modern-day Iraq and, and Persia. And in chapter 10, we're told this, Cush was the father of Nimrod. Cush was the son of Ham, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. But back when this text was translated by some of the uh, Jewish scholars, um, their commentary on Nimrod took this text, but it, they, they gave a little bit more insight in the Jerusalem Targums. And, and here's what we read there, that Nimrod was powerful in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord, for he was a hunter of the sons of men, and he said to them, depart from the judgment of the Lord and adhere to the judgment of Nimrod. Therefore, it is said as Nimrod, mighty tyrant in the face of Yahweh. By the way, his name means rebel. That's the meaning of the word Nimrod. And he became an empire builder. So again, this is referring to him the first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, uh, Uruk, Akkad, Kalna, and Shinar, which again was Babylonia. So, so what we see is that he, uh, that Nimrod was building an empire, and that at the heart of it was uh, this city uh, of Babylon. Um, a couple of things then uh, that we know or we think. Tradition says that actually, along with uh, being an empire builder, that that his wife had quite a bit of influence on him, and that out of her influence and what happened at this period of time, we had sort of the the origins of what became known as uh, the mystery religions. And uh, the mystery religions, um, uh, you know, would include astrology and uh, polytheism and uh, spiritism 
and immorality. And in light of all of that, then, uh, God confuses language and scatters them. And, you know, I, I was thinking about the fact that uh, this is just three generations after Noah. So you, you, you've had the flood and you've had Noah and then his son Ham, uh, Cush, and then Nimrod. Now, let me fast forward for a bit, and uh, Baker, I'm going to ask you to run my slides because this has gone out again up front. Okay, now, what you see here is the Babylonian Empire, and this comes into play a little bit later, of course, uh, in the Scriptures, and uh, part of what comes into play here, of course, is that it's this empire, and uh, this empire under Nebuchadnezzar, that destroys Jerusalem around 600 um, B.C. and takes captives to Babylon. And if you want to see a little bit of how even the spiritual dimension has progressed, remember that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in the text in Daniel, um, we're told this. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Uh, his mind was troubled and he, he could not sleep. Well, who did he call? Who did he reach out to? Here's what we're told. So the king summoned the magicians, conjurers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. And by the way, the Chaldeans were astronomers, astrologers, to tell him what he had dreamed. So, so you see, even from the time of Nimrod all the way to the time of Daniel, that, that sort of the religious system that has developed um, would have these kinds of elements in it. They, they would, again, oftentimes be referred to as the mystery religions, and uh, they really spread. Uh, they spread throughout the civilized world. And you know what we called these guys uh, that were really the uh, sort of the scholars of the kingdom of Babylon at the time of Daniel is they were called magi. And of course, it's the three magi that come from this part of the world at the birth of Christ, and they know things that the Jews hadn't even put together yet. Part of the reason being that the timetable for the coming of Messiah, if you remember, is part of the prophecy in the book of Daniel. And Daniel was put in charge of these guys. So throughout the centuries, there was this sense that at a certain point in time, a king was coming, and it was the Magi then that actually came and uh, worshipped Christ and brought gifts to him. But a little bit of, uh, of the religion of Babylon in this period of time. So if you think just about the word, because then the word Babylon, it, it takes on a symbolic image. And the symbolic image that it takes on would uh, include a lot of what we've seen so far. Uh, man uh, attempting to usurp God's authority, uh, a man-centered universe, what we call humanism, uh, a, a perhaps a man-made pseudo-religion uh, that involved these, uh, these elements we've talked about, and uh, a, a lifestyle. There was a lot of uh, immorality involved in these uh, religions. And certainly, uh, by the time of Daniel, uh, persecution of the Jews. And so Babylon had this kind of uh, image that it, it, it began to be a term that represented godless society. And I, I'd like to suggest that really what it becomes a symbol of is what the Bible calls the world. Now, not the world in terms of the physical world, but the world in terms of a system, a belief system, a way of looking at life, a way of living that, again, the scriptures refer to by using this term, the world. Now, by John's day, the epitome of that system 
was Rome and the Roman Empire. So, John, uh, you can kind of see the arrow here. Let me see. Well, first of all, here's Rome. And, of course, John is writing from over here on uh, Patmos. And, uh, and Rome and the Roman Empire uh, became, again, the, the epitome of the world system. And it, it gets referred to as Babylon. It's like code, which is part of what goes on in Revelation because uh, partially they didn't want to just blatantly talk about the destruction of Rome and the Roman Empire because it would have brought more heat on the Christian community. So instead, they refer to it as Babylon. Uh, by the way, some of those that, uh, uh, that look at the text and think that it, it was uh, all of Revelation took place in the first century, uh, so there were some that thought it was a reference to Jerusalem, but the overwhelming uh, scholarship seems to point towards Rome. Now, how does Babylon fit in to Revelation? Because now we're 500 years past Daniel by the time that uh, uh, Revelation gets written. And the reference now to Babylon is that this world system, Babylon, is now a, a whore. And uh, in the text, we're going to look at a couple of uh, verses here. Um, there's a play on words here, uh, almost like the play on words for reign and king and kingdom we looked at last week. And uh, this word that, 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 it, that uh, the writer plays with is the word pornace, and uh, it was the word for a whore. Uh, and again, NIV translates it the great prostitute. Uh, others translate it as... Uh, as the great horror of Babylon. And we read, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who is seated on many waters. Now, if you go to the next verse, um, from that root, the word porneo uh, means to actually commit uh, sexual immorality and then the word porneia uh, is a reference to immorality or unlawful sex itself and so the text reads this with her the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her uh, adulteries and the horror and 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 this is where things get tricky in the text because along with being a symbol we think that that the horror also uh, is connected with a an entity a Roman Empire uh, is connected with a city Rome itself and so that's where the text uh, gets a little bit uh, confusing but but really the the horror of Babylon ha has two big uh, jobs and the first is to seduce people away from God uh, using whatever it takes so that the world system uh, is designed to seduce people away from God. Now, in the following text right after this, in uh, chapter uh, 17, we, we, we read, we get a vision of her. And this, again, is, is an angel that carries John away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, had seven heads, ten horns. We've read that before. But now look at how she's described. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. And she held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her uh, adulteries. And, and so the things that would kind of seduce people to buy into the world system, okay, gold and precious stones and, and pearls, the, these things, she's just adorned with the things that sort of, again, have this attraction and, uh, and seduction and, in, and are at the heart, really, of, of the world system. By the way, uh, here's a little pitch on my new book, The Solomon Syndrome. 
one of the things that you'll see, see is that the Solomon syndrome itself, which is a problem that the book talks about how do you break free of this and, and, and what uh, was the blueprint that God designed really to uh, give our lives meaning and, and make us happy. But when you look at Solomon, Solomon had just mastered the world system. I think that's probably the reason that the book of Ecclesiastes was included in Scripture. Some people question whether it should even be in there because there's not really a lot about God. And, uh, you know, there are statements that are made in there that, that seem that to at least be uh, somewhat contradictory to the rest of Scripture. But I think, I think it's put in there because Solomon talks about how he masters the world, and in mastering it even in a way that a few people ever will, uh, that the end result for him was this sense of meaninglessness. So uh, again, and as a spoiler, I think part of what we're going to see when we get to the end of the book of Revelation is that, is that when the new Jerusalem comes, the things that have so seduced and attracted people throughout the centuries are just going to be used as construction materials. You know, that uh, streets and, and gates and buildings, they'll be built out of this stuff. And I, and I think it's maybe God making a statement like, boy, you know, you, you put your eggs in the wrong basket. That uh, these things seduced you away from me and, and in reality, you know, they are, they are nothing. So that the first task she has is that, uh, you know, she seduces uh, people away. And here's the second, is that she also persecutes and murders God's people. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Note, by the way, she rides the beast. And the beast that she rides, the next uh, uh, verse in the chapter talks about it again. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. And the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. And really, the explanation that the angel is going to go into here very similar, almost a repeat of Revelation chapter 13 where we first encountered the beast. This is a symbol again uh, of the beast, which is probably in John's day, uh, again, Rome and the Roman Empire and the Roman Emperor, uh, but with a much uh, bigger meaning in terms of how it will fill, uh, be fulfilled in end times prophecy. But uh, seven heads and ten horns, and, and, and it's explained here in verse 8, the beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The world will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. And if we go on to the next two verses this calls for a mind with wisdom the seven heads of the beast are seven hills on which the woman sits now they are also seven kings now this is where it gets confusing because the same symbols being used in two different ways uh, they, they, uh, the seven heads are seven hills and then uh, they are also seven kings Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. A couple of things about the text. Um, first of all, Rome uh, was known as the city that sits on seven hills. And literally, it was built, uh, and the geography of the city is are, are these seven hills. And so, again, it, it's a reference, uh, the, the Babylon being made a reference to, uh, in John's day, the, the city of Rome. 
Uh, but it also represents seven kings. And then there's really been two ways of looking at that uh, throughout history. Uh, one believed that the seven kings that are referred to here uh, would be seven uh, emperors. Uh, there had been seven Caesars up until this point in time in the Roman Empire. And also, uh, you've got this text about uh, one who uh, was and is not, but is coming uh, again. And, uh, and so that ties in with what we talked about last week, uh, that there was this, this uh, sort of tradition of the possibility that uh, Nero was going to be reincarnate or revived and uh, that, uh, he, that he would be the beast, um, and others that it refers to the future where there could be this revived Rome, the seven kings. Others think that it might be a reference even to seven kingdoms. Um, because they're, they're uh, prior to the time of Daniel, where Daniel talks about the coming of four world kingdoms, actually five, if you count in chapter 9, this idea of a revived Rome. Uh, but prior to Daniel, you had the Egyptian empire, then the Assyrian empire. Daniel is there at the time of the Babylonian empire. It's followed by the Medo-Persian empire, then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. So you have these seven world empires. Uh, five have fallen, okay? Uh, one is, which would be Rome, uh, the Roman Empire, and one is yet to come, which again will be the beast of the end times. Uh, we're told specifically what the ten horns are also. So when you go to the next text, we're told this, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. And then we're told what their purpose is and their, their destiny. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. But here's their destiny. They will wage war against the Lamb. And of course, we've seen part of this last week because again, the chronology here sort of gets kind of all mixed up. Uh, they will wage war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will triumph over them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. And again, when we saw the armies of heaven uh, coming with the rider on the white horse, I think this ties in again and lets us know that at least part of that army are going to be believers that, uh, that have been caught up to be with him or who have been martyred uh, or have lived throughout the, the centuries. And so, uh, you know, the, 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 the woman, and let's skip ahead, there's one more text. Then at the end of the chapter, this seems a little bit out of the blue, uh, uh, John writes this, or the angel tells him, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth, which again would be Rome. And uh, then what the text is now going to do is it's going to tell us about the fall or the destruction of Babylon. And again, this is the end of the world system. When, when this is over, uh, when Armageddon is finished, when Christ has come, the world as we know it uh, will be over. You know, the world, it's a mess. I mean, you just can't look at what's happening in the world today and, and wonder, where is all of this going? I mean, it, our news is so focused on both uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, which is horrible, really all over the world, and uh, and then we, it's been so focused on the election and issues surrounding that. But you know, if you read a, an international newspaper or a newspaper that carries more international news, or or simply uh, you know kind of pay attention, th there's just you know craziness everywhere, and uh, and, and the world is just. It's a mess, but it is going 
to fall. It's going to pass away and it's going to change and there will be a new world and that's part of what we're going to see coming in Revelation. But one of the central messages of the book, and I can't emphasize this enough because Usually when we think about Revelation, we think, you know, the main message is Jesus is coming again. But one of the main messages of the book is that Babylon is going to fall. Uh, This world, as we know it, is going to end. Now, this begins with a pronouncement, chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit and a haunt for every unclean bird and a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Now, and then I heard another voice from heaven say, well, I'll get get to this text in just a minute. So this pronouncement is made. In the first century, again, um, it's obvious that it's a reference to Rome and the Roman Empire. Uh, Only the praetorists, and I talked about that, a few of them think maybe it's talking about Jerusalem, but that's that's hard to fit into this. So, um, but there's a bigger message, and that is that the day is coming when the world system as we know it will be destroyed. And if you take a futurist perspective toward the book, which is the primary view that we've been taking it from, At the end of the age, there will be a city like, quote, Babylon. There will be a city like the Rome of John's day. And and the things that are expressed here uh, will apply to it. And when you you read the text we're getting ready to read, it it really feels like a real city or, or somehow the empire of the beast. But right in the midst of the fall, uh, this call is given to believers here in this verse. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Now, is this a, a literal call to believers where they're being told, Leave Rome Or is it a spiritual call? And I I tend to lean this direction, that that really the idea to come out is to be separate from this world system. You know, uh, another place in 1 John basically says that the same message, don't love the world or anything in the world. And again, this would be the seduction that people have bought into. And if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. And then he goes on and he says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh and and, uh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, everything the world system's about comes not from the Father, but what? From the world, again, from this Babylon, uh, from this whore, this system Revelation talks about. And then finally, this this, uh, kind of truth that the world and its desires pass away. And that's exactly what we're seeing now in Revelation. We're seeing the world system pass away. Babylon being destroyed. The fall, fallen, fallen is Babylon. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Uh, You know, you think about it. And, uh, you know, oftentimes it's expressed uh, almost as a cliche, but, you know, uh, it's, it's not easy to follow Christ in a fallen world. And uh, when we look at Scripture, 
the reason why it's so hard, we're told, is that there are three forces that are allied against us, uh, you know, trying to suck us away from being faithful and obedient followers of Christ. Uh, one of them is the Bible calls the flesh, which is the part of our inner nature that is uh, fallen. Uh, you know, we're strange creatures when we come into relationship with Christ because when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, He creates a new nature within us, but that old nature is still there. And Paul in Romans says that's why this struggle exists internally. And then, of course, there, there's the devil who is the enemy who wants to destroy you and, uh, and again, is allied against all the purposes of God. And then the, the third uh, force that makes it difficult is the world itself because there is this system that's so seductive. And what Revelation is saying is that all three of those are going to be eliminated uh, when Christ comes again. Because first of all, you, you and I will be transformed. And uh, when we see Him, the Scripture says, we will be like Him. And the, uh, the new you that will come when your old self is risen and caught up to be with Christ and then returns, you won't have an old nature. That, that part of you will be gone. You will be built in a way that every intention of your heart will be to serve and to obey and to more than anything to love God and to be open to receiving His love. The devil and his forces get destroyed. We've already seen the, the false prophet and uh, the, the beast thrown into the lake of fire. And uh, next week we're going to see what happens to the devil. So, so that enemy will be destroyed. And then the, the world is going to be changed. Babylon will fall, and, and there's going to be a, a new world that we live in that won't be hostile. Uh, it will be in perfect harmony with the will of God. So uh, all of this, you know, is what's contained here in the book of Revelation, and specifically tonight, obviously, Babylon. Now, the response to the fall of Babylon very interesting. There, there, are, uh, there are kind of four responses that are in the text. And uh, the first three have to do with a, a lament, uh, uh, a lament of an unbelieving world. So first of all, the kings of the earth, we read this. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her, and it's not talking about just physical adultery, it's talking about unfaithfulness to God and commitment, again, uh, to the whore, okay? When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. And here's part of what they say. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe! Woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon, in one hour your doom has come. They, it, it, they put their eggs in the wrong basket, basically, and they're realizing it now. And, and one hour refers to, you know, quick. I mean, when the fall comes, it, it takes place quickly. Uh, secondly is the lament of the merchants. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. And then their lament goes on, and, and what they say is, Woe, woe to you great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stone, pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin." And again, uh, it's as if they realize they've put their treasure in the wrong place. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And their treasure, again, was in the wealth of the world as merchants. Uh, the economic systems, the business leaders, the, the ultra-wealthy ultra see the destruction 
of Babylon. And then third, uh, the sea captains and sailors. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off. And then they give their, their lament. Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, notice all three of them, in one hour, just instantly, she has been brought to ruin. But the fourth response comes from God's people, the saints. And what their response is, is this. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed upon you. Let me just wrap it up this way. Babylon, the world system, godless society, the seduction of affluence and materialism and worldly power, uh, false religion, uh, the persecution of people of faith, all of that's Babylon. Uh, the whore, a symbol of the spiritual reality that stands behind many earthly expressions. Uh, in Nimrod's day, Tower of Babel. In Daniel's day, the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar. In John's day, Rome and its empire. And I would say in our day, yet to be determined. So where are we? Armageddon is fought, Christ returns, Babylon is destroyed, a new age is about to begin, and it begins with what futurists believe is a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth called the millennium, and that's what we will look at next Wednesday night. Biff, why don't you come on up and let's see what our questions are. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob. That was incredible. And uh, thank you so much for all of your research and all your dedication to the Word of God and really causing us to be obedient to reading it so that we can get a blessing out of it. So our questions tonight have been laid out for us. And the first one is this. If Babylon was a modern city, what do you think or which city do you think it would be? If Babylon is a modern city, what city do you think it would be? My guess would be New York City. No, I'm joking. Question number two. What did John mean when he said the world was passing away? What did John mean when he said the world was passing away? And our final question what could you do to come out of Babylon? 